Most people can't concentrate for two reasons, right? One is they've never been taught how to concentrate. Second is they never practice concentration. How many of you growing up here in school had classes on concentration every single day that you, the same way you had classes on geography, on math, on science? Anybody? I travel all around the world and I ask this question and nobody puts their hand up. How many of you, when you were growing up in school, were told to concentrate? Isn't that amazing? You get told to concentrate, but you never get taught how to do it, right? When I was growing up, I got told to concentrate all the time. Dandapani, concentrate on doing your homework. Dandapani, concentrate on eating your food. Anybody want to show me how to do it? No. How many of you have kids? How many of you tell your kids to concentrate? Have you ever showed them how to? No, right? And then if you don't show them how to concentrate, how would they know how to do it? And then if you want to be good at something, you have to practice it. If you want to be really good at concentration, you need to practice it all day. People are good at distraction because that's what they practice all day long. It's not that they don't have the ability to concentrate. They've just practiced distraction and become really, really good at it. So how do we concentrate? We concentrate by practicing doing one thing at a time and integrating this practice into our everyday life. So for me, I look at my average day and I ask myself, what's a reoccurring event in my life? Every day I speak with my spouse. Every time I speak with my spouse, I give her my undivided attention. I keep my awareness on her. It drifts away, I bring it back. It drifts away, I bring it back. I keep my awareness on her, I give her my undivided attention. Now every day I also speak to my clients. I speak with my clients, I speak with my friends, family. Every time I speak with somebody, I give them my undivided attention. If I'm on the phone, I give the person on the phone my undivided attention. I practice doing one thing at a time. By the end of the day, I've clocked about maybe six to eight hours of practicing concentration. Six months later, I become really good at concentration. 12 months later, I become really good at concentration. The best way to become good at something is to take a tool and insert it into a reoccurring event in your life. And this is the best way to become good at something rather than to create another practice in your life. Just take a tool and insert it into the practice, into a reoccurring event in your life. So your homework, is to give someone, or whatever you're doing, your undivided attention. Pick one person in your life for the next one month that you will give your undivided attention to. Every time you speak with that person, stay completely focused on them, keep your awareness on them. The rest of the day, you can go ahead and be a squirrel. But on just whenever you're speaking with that person, give that person your undivided attention. And you need to practice and build in incremental steps. The other thing we need to learn to develop is our willpower. Right? Everybody is born with various levels of willpower, but one thing we never get taught to do is to actually develop willpower. And willpower is like a muscle. I call it a mental biceps. If I could draw biceps around my mind, that would be my willpower. There are three ways to develop willpower. One, finish what you begin. Two, finish it well beyond your expectations. Three, do a little bit more than you think you're able to do. All of these three ways require effort, and that effort is willpower. Right, so how do I develop willpower? I take these three methods and I apply it to things that reoccur in my life. What's something that reoccurs in my life every day? Every day I sleep. What a great opportunity to develop willpower. Before I go to sleep, I floss, I brush my teeth, put on my pajamas, I go to sleep. When I wake up in the morning, I finish the process of sleep. How do I finish the process of sleep? I make the bed every day. So every day I wake up in the morning, I make the bed. What's something else that I do every day? Every day I have breakfast. If I have time to make breakfast, I have time to eat breakfast, then I have time to do the breakfast dish and put it away, right? So I finish the process that I begin, and I bring this into everything that I do. Then throughout the day, I develop willpower. The more I practice this, the better I get. Now I have tremendous amount of willpower. After six months, I've developed a lot of willpower. Every time my awareness drifts away, I use that mental muscle, that willpower, to bring my awareness back. Then I use the powers of concentration that I've developed to hold my awareness on what I'm focused on. And because I'm focusing on that, where my awareness goes, energy flows, and my, now my energy is flowing towards what I want, that starts to manifest in my life. That's why it's so important, firstly, to understand there's a separation between awareness and the mind, two completely different things. You control where your awareness goes, you control where your energy is flowing, and you control what's manifesting in your life. And you use your powers of concentration and your willpower to hold your awareness on the priorities in your life. The next thing we want to do is to learn to manage energy in our life right? 
this is based on the premise that we only have so much energy each day. We have a finite amount of energy each day. Each day we have this much energy, we take our energy and we invest it into people and things around us. We keep investing, investing, investing until we have no more energy left. We get exhausted, that's usually around 11 or 11.30 or midnight. We go to sleep, our energy builds up again. We go out the next day and we invest our energy into people and things till we have no more energy. But, but the one thing most people don't do is we never evaluate who and what we're investing our energy in. So I always tell people to treat energy the same way you treat money. It's a finite resource that needs to be wisely managed, wisely reallocated, and wisely invested. No matter how rich you are, you only have so much money, right? And before you spend money, most of us think and evaluate what we're investing our money in. If somebody asks us for $5,000 or $30,000 to invest into a startup or a company, we would ask questions. We just wouldn't hand them $30,000. We would ask, what's your plan with it? What are you going to do with this money? What's my return on my investment? Because it's a finite resource. So why don't we do the same thing with energy? Before we invest energy into someone or something, why don't we evaluate if that person or that thing is deserving of our energy? Because if you only have this much energy, and if I took 10% of my energy and I gave it to John, that's 10% I could have given to my spouse, my business, the things and people that I love. Remember the law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred or transformed from one thing to another, right? So I can't create energy. If I give 10% to John, I want to know he's going to do something good with it. Because if he's just going to squander it, I'd rather take it and give it to the people and things that I love. So why is it important to manage energy? For me, the greatest impetus for managing energy is, is death. Death is the greatest impetus for me to manage energy. I realize that life is finite, that I only have one life as me. And regardless of my beliefs, I know I have one existence and as Dandapani. And what happens after death? I'm not quite sure. We all have different upbringings, different religious beliefs. Some people say when you die, you go to heaven or hell. Some people say when you die, it's game over. That's it. Nothing happens afterwards. Some people say when you die, you get reincarnated as a man or woman. And others say you get reincarnated as a man, woman, maybe an insect or an animal. But no one really knows. We have our beliefs and we hold strongly to them. But no one's ever died, gone to heaven, taken a selfie, come back, posted it on Instagram, and said, look at me here in heaven, hashtag pearly gates, right? <laughs> so we don't quite know, but the one definitive thing is that we know we're going to die. And I know I have a finite amount of life. I don't believe life is short, but I do believe it's finite. And because I, my life is finite, I want to be extremely clear where to focus my energy. There's no point learning to concentrate if you don't know what to concentrate on. So along with learning concentration, it's really important to also learn what to focus on. So what I would recommend as a homework is to be clear what your purpose in life is. One way to do this is to spend five minutes each morning reflecting on what your purpose of life is. Get to know yourself. Most people are happy to spend time with other people and things, but very few people actually make time to spend time with themselves. So when you wake up in the morning, take a shower, go to a quiet place in your house, sit down, and ask yourself questions about you. What do you want in life? What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What do I love? What am I passionate about? How many people can generally answer, this is my, say, this is my purpose in life? Very, very few people. Once you're clear with your purpose, you know what to concentrate on, and you know what to direct your finite amount of energy towards. Right? So the next thing we want to look at is energy consumers. Right? People and things are two of the biggest consumers of energy. And people and things also give you a lot of energy. Since the subject is vast and time is short, let's focus on the people that consume energy and how we can deal with them. I call these people uh, energy vampires. All right? That's what a vampire does, right? Bites you in the neck and suck the life out of you. And some people consume tremendous amount of energy. Essentially speaking, there are three types of people. And let's keep this simple, monk simple. They are uplifting people, they are neutral people, and they are not uplifting people. Okay? <laughs> Let's define what this is, okay? what they are. An uplifting person, I spend five minutes with an uplifting person, I walk away, I feel great, and go like, wow, that was an amazing conversation. A neutral person, I spend five minutes with them, I walk away, I'm still the same. A not uplifting person, I spend five minutes with them, I walk away, and I go like, oh my god, that was exhausting. Right? And you've probably experienced that in your life. So then the next question is to ask is, are they an energy vampire? The two ways to figure this out, one is I can judge or I can evaluate. 
right? What's judging and evaluating? Judging is this. I'm at a party at, in New York City in a penthouse. There are 200 people in the room. The door opens. This guy walks in. He's got white shoes, a purple suit. He's got a cane and a top hat. He's wearing a chain with a big clock hanging off his chest. I look across the room and I go, he must be a pimp or a drug dealer. That's judging, right? I didn't get to know him. I just judged he was a pimp or a drug dealer. Evaluation is this. I spent 50 occasions with John over a period of two years. 49 of those I walk away from and I go like, oh my God, that was exhausting. It's safe for me to evaluate that John is an energy vampire. Okay. Then there are two types of energy vampire. The next question is, are they a transient energy vampire or inherently an energy vampire? Right? What's a transient energy vampire? Just say John is going through a hard time in life because his dad is dying of cancer, for example. And for three years, he's, he consumes a lot of energy. You know, he's always down. You need to uplift him. He's feeling very sad. It's okay. You give him that energy because he's your friend, and that's what we do. We express compassion, empathy, and love, and we support our friends during difficult times. What's someone who's inherently an energy vampire? Someone who's inherently an energy vampire has always been this way. For decades, they just haven't changed. They're just not an uplifting human being at all. So how do we deal with someone who's inherently an energy vampire? So before I go there, quick question for all of you. How many of you in this room feel like you have someone who's inherently an energy vampire in your life? That's a lot of people in this room, right? So how do we deal with someone who's inherently an energy vampire, right? My guru taught me the best way to do this is to practice the art of being affectionately detached, but always kind, gentle, sincere, and loving towards them. What does this mean? So just say John is inherently an energy vampire. I live in New York City. I'm walking down Fifth Avenue. I see John walking towards me. What do I do? Do I cross the street? That's not very nice. I meet John. John meets me. What do you say when two people meet each other? I know what you guys say in Australia. G'day. How's it going, mate? Right? Do I say that? No. Do you know why I don't ask how are you? Because I don't want to know. <laughs> it's true. You have to understand, I'm in the monk business. When I ask somebody, how are you? They tell me their entire life story. <laughs> it's the confession time. So I don't even ask, how are you? John asks me, how are you? I say, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. And then I reply, what a beautiful day in Sydney, right? <laughs> It's true, I'm being sincere, I'm being kind. And then I say to him, please excuse me, I have something really important to do. It's true, my life is finite, and I'm very clear what my purpose is, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not lying. And then what do people say at the end of a conversation? It was a pleasure meeting you. Actually, it wasn't. Let's do lunch, why? <laughs> See you later, not really, don't want to. <laughs> why do we say the things we don't mean and ask the questions we don't want answers to? So at the end of a conversation, I say, have a wonderful day, which is true. I know he's inherently an energy vampire, but I do wish he has a wonderful day. So the concept of being affectionately detached is to not engage with someone, right? Just to be kind, to be gentle, to be sincere and loving towards them, but not engaging with them. What's another way to protect yourself from an energy vampire? Is to place the burden of responsibility on them. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. I have a client of mine who's an expert in social media. Right? So a lot of people want to get together with him, have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine. Let's catch up for lunch. Let's do dinner. Why? Because they want to pick his brain right? and get information from him. And he can't sustain this because everybody wants to a little bit of his time and he just can't live this way. So I told him, this is what you need to do. You need to, you need to tell this person who wants to meet with you to read your favorite marketing book. Read your favorite marketing book, write down seven key points and email it to you. Once you receive the seven key points from the book, tell them that you, know, you want to see what stands out to them in the book. Once you receive these seven key points, you email them and say, let's meet up on this day for a couple hours and we can discuss uh, a marketing strategy for you, strategy for you. You know how many people actually read the book and email him the seven key points? Nobody. As soon as you place the burden of responsibility on someone, they don't do it. I travel all around the world. I speak, people come up to me and they want to ask questions. I always give them my personal email address. I tell them, please don't share it with anybody. Can you put your question down on this email and send it to me? One, it'll give me time to reflect on it and I can give you a proper response. And they always say, for sure, I'll put it all down in email and I'll send it to you. You know how many people email me? Nobody emails me. 
simple little task, right? I'm not asking them to do yoga, to meditate, to breathe out of one nostril. You just send me an email with your problems, and they don't do it. So place the burden of responsibility on someone. If you're somebody who's developed a particular skill, you're an expert in a particular niche, in a particular area, and you find that people want your time, they want your energy, the one simple way to protect yourself is to place the burden of responsibility on them. Give them a simple task to do and see if they do it. And if they fulfill that task and come back to you, then go out of your way to help them, okay?